Hey, welcome in everyone to a week seven edition of the GLIAC football podcast on d2football.com. I'm your pal, Tony Nicolette, hanging out with you for another week of GLIAC action. Uh, exciting stuff going on now, guys. We've got some major rivalry games going on this week. We're starting to see some trends and some traits as, we, as we've passed the halfway mark of the season. You know, starting to get a feel for who's who, what's what. And uh, we're setting up for some interesting interesting games as we move through week seven and into the final month of the season. Hard to believe that after this weekend, we're only going to have four Saturdays left. So uh, definitely lots to look at in terms of where we, how we've gotten to where we are, but also as we start to get onto the horizon of looking into how the GLIAC race is shaping up. And I know I always say that I won't do any playoff talk until the very latter part of the season, usually heading into week 11. Uh, but I will say that folks start to do, start to take a look at that. Um, and you know, people start thinking ahead to how things can shake out. Tons of football to be played, though, and that's part of what maybe makes things a little bit more interesting as we go through the last four weeks of the season is all of that uh, consequential stuff that happens every Saturday all around the GLIAC and, of course, around the country as well. So uh, let's dive right into uh, what we've got coming up here this Saturday uh, and take a look at the games that are coming up and, and talk a little bit about what happened last week as we go through uh, the preview of this Saturday's action. So the only non-conference game that we have this week is Saginaw Valley heading down to Metro Chicago to take on uh, St. Xavier uh, in of the NAIA. And Saginaw, boy, got to say, it's it's probably a pretty dis- disappointing spot that they are in right now. You know, they start off 2-0, and had a real good uh, level of excitement coming into the season after an 8-3 and season last year. Um, where you know many thought that maybe they might have been really somebody that should have finished at least nine and two and had a playoff spot, and they start the season off with two straight wins, and now here they sit after week six at two and four, four straight losses for the Cardinals, uh, and and again part of we talked a little bit last week about why that might be happening, and and I think we're continuing to see it where the the difficulty rushing the ball. Uh, has been just you know such a stymie for their offense here. Again, they they were such a huge rushing team, and they ran for four thirty in week one against Winona State, and now they they basically slid week over week over week after that. They did get back up uh, into the mid one hundred yard range uh, against uh, Ferris State last week, so they actually were a little bit more effective uh, and a little bit more on norm. But gosh, it was still not not the type of output that they needed. They were able to keep it close in the first half. Uh, but really got pulled away from by Saginaw Valley, or excuse me, by Ferris State as the game progressed. Michael Horro did go the distance at quarterback, so they at least have established some sort of consistency. Again, not sure what Jairus Grissom's health might uh, be contributing to that, but you know he actually played quite well in terms of the passing game and ran the ball relatively well also, but just not enough offense to be able to hang with, with Ferris. And one of the things that w- is worrisome for Saginaw Valley fans going into this Saturday was just – the frequency with which they were beaten deep uh, in the pass game by Ferris State. Um, and, you know, they're going to be playing. And so, again, this week, uh, even though it's an NAIA team uh, in St. Xavier that uh, Saginaw is going to be playing, don't kid yourself, guys. This is a 4-2 and two outfit. Their two losses are uh, by single scores to two teams who are ranked in the NAIA top six. Uh, so, <laughs> and they've already beaten another ranked team uh, in their four wins. So this is a team that can play a little ball. And they do throw the ball relatively effectively, so it may not be their primary source of moving it, but they they do it well enough. Uh, in fact, uh, two thirds of their passing touchdowns, or excuse me, of their t- uh, touchdowns scored this year have been through the pass game. So uh, this is a team that can throw the ball, and so Saginaw Valley uh, secondary, who actually looked pretty good in sp- different spots this year, uh, particularly against Grand Valley a couple weeks ago have also had a couple of games where they just looked a little clunky. Obviously, again, at Ferris last week, uh, they got ripped pretty good by uh, Indianapolis the week before that. So uh, that's one thing that Ferris fan, or excuse me, Saginaw Valley fans are going to have to look out for in this game is can St. Xavier move the ball, period, but oh, certainly through the air. That might be where uh, Ferris is going to have to do, or excuse me, gosh, Saginaw Valley, I keep mixing those two teams up. They're going to have to do a better job of running the ball, controlling the clock, and controlling the tempo, and keeping – St. Xavier's offense off the field because if they are able to get a lead, the Cougars that is, uh, Saginaw Valley has just shown that their run game is, even though it was their bread and butter, they haven't been as dominant or as effective in that phase of the game over the last four, five, four weeks or so. 
So they're going to have to try and figure that out. And, and again, if they can be more effective there and keep the Cougars off the field, then it gives Saginaw Valley uh, a much better chance of going on the road and getting the win. Uh, we'll move uh, the second game that we'll talk about. We'll actually move over to uh, the Jewel of the Lodge and the Wayne State Warriors coming off the uh, first GLIAC victory of the Tyrone Wheatley era uh, in a 23-21 win over uh, Michigan Tech. Uh, they'll fl- play host to the number 16 ranked uh, Davenport Panthers. So uh, Wayne State enters the game at 2-3. and three. Uh, Davenport still unblemished on the season at 5-0. and oh, um, And the Panthers have really, over the last couple of games, I, I, you, you hate to describe things this way, but they've almost been a little bit methodical and bordering on boring with how they've just kind of systemically shut down both of the UP teams. Uh, 28 nothing win up at Tech a couple of weeks ago, and then this past week, um, a 28-12 to win over Northern Michigan, where Northern really uh, had to get a, a deep shot touchdown on the last play of regulation to uh, get, the, get to 12 points total. Um, if you really look at that game, Davenport was pretty dominant in this one. In fact, three of their first four possessions in the first half moved all the way into the to the uh, Northern Michigan red zone and were end, and ended on turnovers. So uh, the Panthers outgained Northern by well over 200 yards in the game uh, and really had their way with moving the ball. They just kind of stymied themselves on a couple of a uh, couple of possessions uh, where they just turned the ball over. So. If they convert any of those into points, the margin actually looks a lot bigger and 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 looks more comfortable than maybe the final net twenty eight to twelve result looks. Um, so when we come into this one, you know Wayne State again coming off that win over Northern Michigan or over Michigan Tech, where honestly Tech actually had the better of it in moving the ball, uh, and Wayne was uh, outgained significantly. And I think that's one of the things that we're going to watch in this one is okay with how ineffectively Tech and Northern move the ball against Davenport. Can Wayne State figure that riddle out and actually get some offense going? Um, uh, Eli McLean did go the distance at quarterback last week, uh, despite Jaden Waddell having maybe having done a little bit more of the action at the helm uh, in weeks prior. And he played a decent game, you know, uh, didn't make uh, any mistakes and was relatively effective in the pass game. But again, Wayne really wants to run the ball first, and they use that quarterback in that run a lot. Um, so how well... Uh, Davenport's able to, to, to stuff that is going to be interesting to watch. Um, but I guess the thing that really concerns me if you're a Wayne State fan going into this one is the fact that uh, the Warriors are giving up over 179 yards a game on the ground. And, of course, they're <laughs> one of their top players from last year, Myron Harris, is now suited up uh, in the uh, red and black of uh, the Davenport Panthers, and he has proceeded to lead the GLIAC in rushing through six weeks at just a hair under 120 yards a game. So um, if if Wayne's going to have a shot to, to conclude their somewhat unusual four-game homestand <laughs> in Detroit, you don't see that very often, um, they're going to have to find a way to shut down the Davenport run game. And, and based on what we've seen so far, that's going to prove to be a challenge for them. And then on the other side of it, too, that, again, we talked about Eli McLean leading the, the Wayne State offense. They're going to have to be a little more effective than they have, and it's going to be a challenge there, too, because Davenport has kind of very quietly put together a resume so far this year that says that they've only been giving up 15 points a game. So they've really done a good job of shutting folks down, again, particularly since Gleak play started a couple weeks ago. Uh, neither Tech nor Northern has done much on them. So this one seems to favor Davenport, but, you know, it'll be interesting to see if, uh, there's any momentum that uh, the Warriors are able to sustain here after getting, getting that uh, first GLIAC win and knocking off Tech uh, a week ago. So from there, we will head to the the Upper Peninsula for one of the, the coolest rivalry games in, in all the land, in my opinion, and that's the Miners' Cup uh, battle every year. Uh, Michigan Tech and Northern Michigan will uh, will fight it out for supremacy of uh the folks that live above the bridge, I guess they refer to us as trolls down here in the lower peninsula. So fair enough with that. Um, Tech comes in at three and two after a three and zero start. Uh, they did drop uh, their last pair uh, of contests and then both of them in the GLIAC, uh, losing again. And then one of those in a, in a game against Davenport where they just moved the ball, didn't move the ball at all. Um, and despite dropping uh, a close decision at uh, Wayne last week, they actually moved the ball quite well. And, their 191 yards rushing in that game was actually one of the bigger 
rushing totals that we've seen out of the Huskies in quite some time. I think their high high water mark for last year might have been 106. So for them to put a buck 91 up, uh, you know, hey, maybe they're making some progress in the run game again. I mean, we talked a little bit of how uh, Wayne's uh, rush defense might be what might cure what ails you when it comes to that. Um, unfortunately for Northern Michigan, uh, when we're coming into this one, their rush defense has actually been uh, every bit as porous and perhaps more so <laughs> than than Wayne's has. Um, you know, the the Wildcats are giving up uh, a little bit over 248 a game. So this uh, bodes well for, for uh, Michigan Tech to continue to figure things out on offense as Alex Freeze continues to get acclimated into the starting role at quarterback. Uh, Ethan Champney is actually leading the GLIAC in receiving yards per game at a little over 97 a clip. Uh, so, you know, we're going to look for them to – the Huskies, or the Huskies really want to have balance in their offense. That's the way they've always played it. So, you know, they're going to look for the Champneys and the Willises uh, to, to latch onto as many as they can and get some yardage that way. But, you know, let's see if Will Morano can put uh, uh, back-to-back 100-yard efforts together. And we'll see what Alex Freeze maybe does if he runs the ball a little bit more often as well uh, on some design keeps and whatnot. Because, again, that's one of the things that uh, Northern is, is struggling to do, just like Wayne is, is stop the run. Uh, and then, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, if if uh, Tech is able to move the ball as well as, as we think they can in this one, uh, you know, what Northern's going to be able to do to counter that with uh, awesome offense of their own. Uh, you know, they were starting to move the ball decently in a couple of games, but now we're, we're, we're set with another set of challenges here as uh, uh, quarterback Mariano Valente left the game. Uh, at Davenport last week with a with a ding, and I don't know what his status is going to be coming into this one if he's going to be available or not. Uh, but obviously, if you're if you end up going to somebody who's never gotten a start uh, for Northern or perhaps in college ever, that's going to take over at the helm. Um, you know, gosh, that's going to be an, an awful lot of pressure uh, for that young man to feel. And I think, um, I think it was Aiden Horde is who took over at quarterback. Uh, for Northern uh, uh, in that game, yeah, Aiden Horde actually did actually you know he was relatively effective, twelve of twenty four for a buck seventy seven touchdown and a pick. You know, not uh, not Sterling numbers, but uh, given the situation he was thrown into, you know, it could have been far worse than that. So uh, we'll have to see if if he ends up getting the nod and if he if he does, how how well he's able to hold down the fort and give Northern a chance to get off the Schneid in this series. I think Tex won. Uh, seven of the last eight or something along those lines. And they certainly have won several in a row. Now, again, this is one of those rivalry games where you kind of throw the records out, but uh, uh, you know, based on what we're seeing thus far, Northern definitely is going to have an uphill climb in this one. And the climb might've even gotten tougher just given that they don't have their primary signal caller running the O. So uh, best of luck to both teams in that one. That was always a fun game. Uh, and I actually got the chance to attend one once uh, many years ago. So uh, very heated rivalry up there in the upper peninsula. And, of course, speaking of heated rivalries, we'll conclude our uh, Week 7 preview here uh, with the Anchor Bone Classic as the top-ranked team in all the land, Ferris State, will take its 4-1 record uh, a little bit down the 131 to uh, Grand Valley State to take on the number 4 Lakers, who are also 4-1. Uh, you know, this is a game where we, we talked about it last year, and we even talked about it a little bit on Inside D2 Football this week, uh, that these are two teams that, um, you know, they don't mirror each other in terms of the styles that they play necessarily, at least from an offensive approach, but they are very similar. Um, if you want to look at a tail of the tape, if you will, just in, in, and how prolific they are offensively and then relatively stingy they are defensively. So, uh, you know, Grand Valley comes in averaging a little bit more in terms of scoring at, uh, 49 a game versus Ferris is 43. Uh, but Ferris is allowing less at 15 a game and Grand Valley at 21. Uh, both teams want to run the ball as their primary, uh, you know, source of, of offense. Grand Valley's coming in a little under 250 a game. Uh, Ferris is at 276. Although we have seen the Bulldogs be a little bit more pass happy this year, uh, particularly last week um, where, uh, you know, Malik Mitchell, uh, came in and did most of the passing work duties, and he was highly efficient. Uh, he's either 12 or 14 or 14 or 16 last week. Uh, threw four touchdown passes. Xavier Wade, and we talked about him throughout the season, and we mentioned him again on Inside D2 Football last, 
that this past Sunday. He's been virtually unguardable, and his per catch average this year is just a gaudy number. I mean, so um, you know, figuring out how uh, to keep him under wraps, but then also just contain all of the speed that uh, that Ferris deploys and employs in general on the edges is going to be something that that we'll be have to pay close attention to in terms of how Grand Valley addresses that. But again, normally Ferris is a run first outfit and they still are, uh, you know, at, you know, rushing the ball at 276 a game and throwing it for 232. So they still put up big numbers in the run game. But again, they've shown a little bit more flexibility in games this year to be able to be a little more pass happy if they need to or if they feel the situation warrants it. And of course, what they do then, too, is they'll switch quarterbacks a little bit because you're going to see if they want to run the ball more. While Mitchell is certainly athletic enough and has shown that he can run the ball highly effectively. Um, the Bulldogs have really gone to Carson Gulker uh, when they want to be more run focused. Um, now Gulker, you know, did uh, have a solid game against Saginaw Valley last week. I think 23 carries for 144 yards. He did get dinged a little late in the game um, when they were kind of, when the, the Bulldogs, I think they were up 31 17 and went down and got a late touchdown to kind of salt it away uh, late in the fourth. And, and he, got tackled over on the sidelines and kind of hobbled his way over to the bench, whether that, you know, is anything of note or not, you know, I guess we'll find out on Saturday, but again, the reality is you got two quarterbacks that can do a lot of different things, uh, but can blend the other uh, facet of the offense in just enough where they become a major challenge. So it's going to be in, uh, a big task for the Laker defense to figure out all right, who's got it, who's figuring out what they're going to do and how you're going to slow them down. And then conversely, you know, it, Grand Valley, again, explosive on offense as well. Uh, their run game maybe is a little bit more traditional in its approach in that uh, uh, it's a little bit more running back focused. They do like to do some work to get uh, wide outs the ball, um, you know, on jet action. And sometimes that's in a, in a run, ga- uh, run game or sometimes with pop passes. Uh, so those do count in the statistics. And then, of course, they do like to run Cade Peterson. Uh, and Avery Moore and, and people like that at the quarterback spot. So it's it's a little bit it, it is a little bit multiple, just maybe not as well defined as 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 you might see with Ferris State. So again, how the Bulldog defense uh, prepares for and, and is able to slow that down is going to be uh, again noteworthy. So when we think about those two games last year, um, I think we call them Rock Fight Part One and Rock Fight Part Two. Um, uh, obviously, we're all going to be. Uh, keeping an eye on this one to see if it's that same physical kind of just, you know, haymaker in the middle of the ring type of thing. I think when it comes down to it, again, we talked about how these teams are very similar in terms of their statistics. Um, you know, the keys to the game are going to be the kind of like they always are when you talk about elite teams is who gets the better line play. And of course that, you know, applies to both the offensive and defensive lines. In this game, I think for me, I'm almost looking more at which offensive line is able to be more dominant and establish the line of scrimmage and get a, the protection that they want for their quarterbacks in the past game, but B, and perhaps more importantly, is able to establish the kind of run game and the kind of control uh, of both the tempo and the clock that they want. Whichever one of those outfits has the better of it, um, that's going to be the team that maybe has the best advantage uh, in, in terms of the duration of the game. You know, Secondly, now that we've seen uh, the return of Xavier Wade and just how uh, big play focused um, – and, and capable Ferris has been in the past game this year, you know, how well does the GV secondary hold up in this game will be uh, something definitely noteworthy. You know, they got, uh, you know, shown a little bit to be weak uh, and, and maybe young or whatever when uh, at, at mines and then a little bit against Pueblo and over the last few weeks against some opponents that maybe can't throw the ball quite as well. They've been much better. Um, and that's a similar arc to what, uh, what we saw last year, same thing. Uh, Mines threw for a gajillion yards in week one, and by the time uh, the middle of the season rolled around, the, the secondary was definitely a little bit better than it had been. So, um, But again, this is a, a level of explosiveness, uh, at least in terms of how Ferris has successfully run its pass offense this year that maybe we weren't seeing last year. So that's going to be a real uh, big key again is, is how well uh, Ferris is able to throw the ball and can the GV secondary keep those big plays limited or to a minimum. And then, uh, you know, similarly, uh, can uh, Ferris's front four or front seven defensively, another key that we're looking for, how well can they slow down the Grand Valley run game? Now, last year in the two games, Grand Valley actually ran the ball extremely effectively, uh, particularly as the first game closed out and in the first 
half or so of the second game. Um, and so how well, uh, especially, you know, with a few different uh, folks in personnel uh, stepping into spots there, is, is Grand Valley going to be able to have the offensive line get the type of push and, and run game established that they want to? Uh, and again, so that's, that's another key then is can they replicate that control that they had last year and be able to do that again? Uh, so that'll be one of the other things that we're looking at. And I think the other one that's maybe a little bit of a an intangible or something that you can't really put your finger on is uh, mistakes. And we always talk about uh, turnovers as being critical in a game like this. But, you know, the one thing that we're starting to notice is the GLIAC is really starting to clamp down and try to be more deliberate about some of the penalty calls that they make, particularly around things like holding and things like that. And, of course, these two teams – tend to be more physical, so maybe they hold a little bit more, and they are both been heavily penalized <laughs> over the last handful of weeks, especially once the Gliac play started. So um, how do the officials adjudicate things in this game? Um, and I think that maybe has the most impact on the offenses, at least in my opinion, because I think if, if you get a lot of holding calls and things like that, those can be real drive killers. And so does one team come out ahead in terms of, uh, you know, maybe getting more drives to you know be successful and not get stalled out, or do they have situations where maybe they're moving the ball well, but all of a sudden a, a, a penalty brings it back? Avoiding those sorts of mistakes is going to be critical for both these teams. So it'll be, uh, of course, it's always interesting to watch and see you know how the the, the officials impact things, and you hope that they don't. Uh, we want to see a clean game with a few flags, and hopefully the, they let the kids play a little bit and. Uh, you know, let things shake out there in terms of letting the athletes and the execution uh, dictate how the result goes. So uh, this one's going to, of course, these are always exciting games, major rivalry game. And of course, so much on the line for both of these teams in terms of uh, having an inside track uh, for the rest of the season on possibly a GLIAC title and then figuring out, you know, what might, uh, what a team's positioning might be for the playoffs Again, so much football left to go, but there's a lot riding on this game and both these teams are always going to get after it and get after each other just because of the rivalry and whatnot. So, Oh, it's going to be a ton of fun to watch that one. So that's week seven, guys. That's uh, what we've got looking into uh, this uh, just past the midpoint of the season. Uh, we'll definitely be back with you again in a week and uh, talk a little bit more about uh, what happened on this uh, rivalry weekend of sorts and uh, take a look ahead into week eight and see where we're going from there. So until then, uh, thanks for joining us here on the Gleak Football Podcast on D2Football.com. And uh, we'll look forward to catching up with you soon. Take care.